acknowledgement that many people who have managed to escape COVID for two years are now being snagged by the virus. Why? Uh, because this sub variant is even more infectious than the last one, which was more infectious than the original Omicron, which is more infectious than Delta. The virus came, seems to keep getting better and better at infecting people. And just in the last couple of weeks, the number of friends and family who have gotten it, who had not gotten it for two years is really pretty staggering. And we're seeing it at work too. A lot more of our, our physicians and nurses are out than, than we've seen ever since maybe December and January. So there's just a lot of COVID around in the environment. And people are being a little less careful than they were, which is understandable since this may be the normal that we have to deal with for the next several years. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons you encouraged Katie to go to that writer's workshop, right, conference. And um, Katie, talk about that. I know um, you took precautions while there last week, right? But talk about the setting. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So I got invited to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's a writer's workshop in Santa Fe, and it's a big deal. And um, I got invited to do it two years ago, and then it got delayed. And so then they invited me again last year, and that ended up getting canceled. And so we did it this year. Um, uh, and we ate indoors, which made me uncomfortable. I even asked the organizer, are we going to eat indoors, really? And he said, well, you know, it's really hard to eat outdoors, da da da, da. And so um, they did ask that everybody be vaccinated um, and show proof of vaccination. But what they didn't ask was that everyone test themselves before the first day of the conference and throughout the week and every morning. And that's what I, in hindsight, should have suggested that they do. Given that I'm married to this guy who knows something, um, knows I should have asked them. He knows <laughs> there too. And, he, and we were kind of like busy and we didn't compare notes. And I mean, what do you think, Bob? I mean, I think that's that could have helped because it was clearly, yeah. let me just tell you, that they that it turns out yeah. that there was some kind of super spreader thing happening well, and i wonder too almost, right i mean that's a great suggestion yeah. and it's another layer of protection but dr walker we're also finding out at the white house correspondence dinner right so many got sick right. and i think they did do the testing yeah there's nothing perfect and if if you want to convene inside and and uh the best you can do is everybody's vaccinated and if you're going to be taking your masks off that everybody does rapid testing that day it gets unwieldy and gets expensive uh, but that would be that would make it safer the safer still would have been better, better ventilation and filters in the room if that's doable and better still would have been eating outdoors so every, you know we all have to kind of navigate all of these different uh, branch points as we go along and yep. and it didn't strike me as being unreasonable what they were doing but as it's turned out, it's turned into something of a super spreader event. How many people now, Katie, have been infected? Oh, you know? Easily a third of the group, all of whom have been vaccinated. Wow. And wow. So, so I guess, does that mean that there was one person who was, what does that mean exactly? Well, first of all, you're not the journalist here, so let's oh. turn. Actually, <laughs> I was just going to say she's the journalist. I am a journalist. journalist. Hello. Exactly. <laughs> You know what? That's true. I'm you are. Sit back here. You, I'm gonna. I'm gonna are. take a sip yeah, of my no. water and enjoy this conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it probably what it what it what it means since you did not get sick until two days after you left the conference and and your test you'd been testing yourself since you left and it was negative and then it turned positive, it means that you got it from someone there, mm. and the fact that it sounds like 15 out of 45 or 50 people got it does you know it was a legitimate super spreader event. And probably there was one person there who was the original person who gave it to a lot of other people. And we still don't understand why some people are super spreaders, whether they have more virus in them, whether there's something about the anatomy of their mouth and nose. It's, uh, it's a great big mystery. Okay, but the good thing was you were infected probably at this conference in this writer's workshop, but then you got on a plane on Friday with Dr. <coughs> Walker to fly to Palm Springs, right, to visit friends. Um, and Dr. Walker, your tweet showed a picture and you said she was hermetically sealed. That picture totally caught my attention on Twitter. I mean, so many people go through Twitter, but that one I was like, what is that? What is she doing? Um, yeah. It turned out this was a good thing, very good thing. Well, it turned out she was doing it largely because we're, of course, on a plane where maybe 30 percent of people were masked. So she was doing it more to protect herself from others. It was a good thing because, as we now know, she had virus in her, but she almost certainly was not infectious at that point. Remember, the, the incubation period is three days. So what 
what almost certainly happened was she caught it on Thursday or Friday. She flew on Friday. She probably was not infectious at that point because the next morning, Saturday, she did a rapid test. It was negative. So she had COVID in her body, in her nose, but not enough of it to infect anybody. And it really wasn't until Sunday morning that she turned positive. Got it. And, and you had been staying with friends, right, in, in Palm Springs. Um, talk about what made you suspect you had COVID and, and why you tested. <laughs> So I didn't suspect I had it. Oh. I was uncomfortable. Yeah, I know, right? So I was, I was, um, I was uncomfortable eating indoors. We were in this group, but this is the weird thing. It feels very much like reality is distorted when everyone's marching around with no mask on, and so you kind of have this really false sense of everything's okay. So I kept going into these weird little bouts of denial about it. And so I did eat indoors without a mask, which now, of course, I um, regret, but I was one of the instructors. So it, I, I was ob obligated to be with the group. Mm. So, so, but then we went to visit this, these friends who were very, very, very close friends who we hadn't seen in a long time. One of them is quite frail and, um, and um, has a bunch of other stuff wrong with him, the comorbidities, right? Right. And, um, and I tested myself because of him, um, it, not because I thought I was sick. Uh, but and not, and not, not because you thought you had COVID, but you right. knew you were coming out of a situation that was right. and that, yes, riskier yeah. than the average. Right. And, and I, think, I think this is all quite rational. Mm. She, Katie was in a situation where she was having more exposure than she normally would. And if she'd just come home to me, I not sure you would have tested every day. It's not that she cares less about me than her friends, I think, but because I'm not particularly vulnerable. You think? We were with this I'm vulnerable sure. couple in their 80s, and so she felt like it was prudent to be really, really careful around them. I see. Well, that was very prudent, as it turned out a good decision as well, because you did test positive, and, um, and that's where things got interesting um, in the sense that you had decisions to make, right? Starting with how to get home, because now you're in Palm Springs, you've tested positive. So Dr. P uh, Walker, you put out a Twitter poll. Uh, if you were in this situation, you asked, would you have stayed in Palm Springs until negative, flown home uh, with a tight N95, or rent car and drive home, <laughs> um, mass windows open? So let's see what your Twitter followers said. They answered this poll and da da da, -da what did people say? Let's just vote, okay, we'll say, Look at that. All right, let's talk about this results. It seems like 57% said cancel the flight, drive home. What did you do? Yeah, it was really interesting. I thought, uh, so Katie woke up before me on yesterday morning and said, honey, and I just the tone of her voice, I said, damn, you're positive. And she said, yes. And then we were flying, we were supposed to fly home from Palm Springs that night at about seven o'clock at night yesterday evening. And we basically sat down and said, you know, are we going to just have you stay or are both of us stay here until you're negative? Or do we fly home and risk that? Or do we rent a car? And we thought about it and talked about it for a few minutes and then decided the safest thing to do, not for us, really, for the other people was on the plane was to rent a car and drive. So we uh, we rented a car and drove nine <laughs> hours from Palm Springs to San Francisco, both of us wearing masks and uh, with, with, the, with the windows open the entire time. Uh, and because we felt like having Katie with known COVID, even wearing a great N95, surrounded by people, most of whom were not gonna be masked, uh, that would be a level of guilt that I think neither of us were prepared to handle. Mm. Right, but how many people do you think don't make that decision? They just say, I wanna get home. Well, on See, the poll, Katie, what is- That I, was I, the I, question I had. You and I are yeah. like this. Yeah. <laughs> So, I, well, I, the, the poll, the poll, I, what was it 50 or 55 percent of people said they would do that. They would they would uh, rent the car and drive the nine yeah. hours uh, and the rest, the 45 percent were equally split between would have stayed put in Palm Springs and would have taken the flight. I'm guessing in real life more people would have taken the flight. Uh, than are willing to admit. And it was amazing. I think 40,000 people answered that poll. Wow. I mean, I think you're right. And as prevalent it is as it is out there right now, if you have a quarter of the people or more making that decision to fly, you know every time you get on a plane, there's somebody with COVID. So consider whether or not you want to put on the mask when you know that. All right, we'll take yeah. a short break and be back with Dr. Walker and Katie Hafner. Be right back.
All right. Uh, boy, you guys are just so terrific in the way you're sharing this with all of us. Hey, folks, if you have questions for Dr. Walker or for Katie, please go ahead um, and ask here right now if you want, because I know their experience may also apply to a lot of people. And um, so, you know, it's interesting because your son got COVID right a few months ago and you, and you documented that on Twitter. But it sounds like he, despite being younger, had a more serious case or more severe symptoms than Katie. Is that right? Yeah, he was more, he had a really terrible sore throat. I don't, do you even have a sore throat oh, at all? Horrible, burning. Horrible. Awful. Oh, you should have, should have told but me. The headache, that. the headache, oh. the, and I'm oh. like, I'm downing these cough drops and then the, the headache actually is, is much worse. Than yeah, the, he had a very throat. bad sore throat for six or seven days. It just shows how much variation there is across individuals there's almost no predicting who's going to have what i mean he didn't have access to paxlovid and still wouldn't because he's he's too young mm -hmm. katie just started on it and by report people are going to think we have pfizer stock honey um by <laughs> by report yeah. you know, people often feel much much better within a day or so of taking it so uh, he was more the natural history i'm guessing katie will feel better in a yeah. day or two <clears throat> Wow, no, I hear that cough and that does sound painful. Um, let me ask you about Paxlovid. Are you tasting a metal taste that a lot of people report yes. really okay. bad? Is it nasty? It, it, is, it is, it's unbelievable. And I wasn't gonna bring it up because I thought, should I, am I gonna sound like I'm whining because I have access to this wonderful drug, but I'm gonna go ahead and whine a little bit. Yes, it, <clears throat> this friend who lives down the street and he started taking Paxlovid yesterday. He said, it's, I've got this awful taste in my mouth. And I thought, oh gosh, that doesn't sound pleasant. And then I took it and I swear to you, within 30 minutes, I just feel like I'm chewing metal. Ugh. All so right, I'm Katie, I'm gonna put you on hold because <clears throat> we're coming back out on TV in just a second here, a couple seconds. And we'll have like four or five minutes. Sh Sherry, we can go five, right? Okay. Mm. We're back now with UCSF Department of Medicine Chair, Dr. Bob Wachter and his wife, Katie Hafner, who has caught COVID. Um, I can see they're zooming in. They, they live in the same household, but they're in different rooms right now because Dr. Wachter is trying his very best not to catch COVID while taking care of Katie. Um, so, you know, maybe this applies to you. In fact, Simone wants to know, Dr. Wachter, with a family of four, mom and dad and eight month old are positive, but the five-year-old is not uh, yet. But if the five-year-old ends up testing positive, can we all then take our masks off? Or is there a possibility of recirculation any advice you can take your mask off once you have it you're not going to get it again in the short term you might get it again three months from now but yeah everybody who has it can act like they they don't need to be isolated from each other anymore okay. it is important to recognize one of the points i one of the reasons i wanted to tweet this is people often assume that one household member has it it's the you know the horse is out of the barn everybody's got it don't even be careful that's just not right the household attack rate is 40 percent so 40 percent of people who live in a household of someone who has it will get it, meaning you have a 60% chance of not getting it. So even though I was exposed to Katie and there's a decent chance I will get it, I haven't gotten it yet and I'm still being uh, pretty careful leaving food on a little uh, little table outside her door. Very sweet. I know, sweet. that is really sweet. Um, I really folks, taken care of. Yeah. If, okay, what if you are the COVID positive one, but you're the household cook and need to prepare meals for everybody? Is that okay? Is that safe if you just wore your mask or does it not matter? No, well, if I was the one who had it, I'd yeah. be whining more. Um, and <laughs> if I was the house, you, you want to isolate as much as you possibly can. The best thing would be to be in your room alone. If you need to come out uh, and be with other people, if you're wearing an N95 and they're all wearing N95s, that's pretty safe. I'd also keep the windows open and really try to have good ventilation as well. Okay. Uh, Daniel wanted to ask if you think you will get it now. Um, I'm going to ask you, you're testing every day. Right. When will you know you're kind of out of the woods after the exposure period? You're safe. You're not going to get it Wednesday or Thursday. So I you know, we were together all day Saturday and Saturday night. And then Katie tested positive on Sunday. She was negative on Saturday. So my period of exposure was probably most of the day Saturday and Saturday night. The incubation period on average is three days. Uh, the, the rapid test is sometimes negative for a day or two after you have it. So I'd say by Wednesday or Thursday, if my rapid test is negative, uh, I'm out of the woods. I might go ahead and get a 
the PCR test to be absolutely mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. on Tuesday or Wednesday just to be on the safe side. Okay. Um, Katie, we know you're taking Paxlovid, the antiviral. You qualify because of your age. Mm -hmm. um, but Dr. Wachter, Stephanie wants to know how can we get it? Um, test to treat pharmacy, question mark? Yeah, there are a few test to treat pharmacies in the Bay Area. Every doctor can prescribe it. Some pharmacies have it. We just found today Walgreens didn't. CVS had a ton, which is weird. Don't understand why. Uh, CVS but, on 19th Avenue. Yeah, the city. I, there's a on COVID.gov. You can go and look up, put in your zip code, and they'll tell you who has it. And, and it's you know, despite the fact that it tastes crummy, it lowers the probability of hospitalization and death by about 90%. So it's really, if, if, if you can get it and you're eligible for it, it's really uh, important to go ahead and take it. Okay, here's a question for both of you, because I'm sure you're discussing this. Um, what will it take, Katie, before you're comfortable coming out of isolation? Some people say, I'm waiting till that little pink line is gone and I'm not showing positive at all on a rapid. Other people say, no, five days isolation. That's what the CDC says anyway. I exit after that because I'm probably not contagious to anybody else. What do you two say? Yeah, the I mean the 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 once if that pink line is still positive, you're still infectious. If you feel perfectly fine and the pink line is is much much fainter than it was, and you're wearing an N95, a well-fitting N95, and you absolutely have to do something, you know, go out because this happens for us at work as well. If we absolutely need someone to staff. Uh, staff something at the hospital and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're minimally positive, they're wearing an N95, that's pretty safe. Uh, but legitimately, if to say you have no possibility of infecting anybody, it should be when that pink line goes away. All right. Um, Dr. Bob Wachter and Katie Hafner, who has COVID, but is, um, you know, great enough to come and join us today and talk to us uh, about her experience and lessons learned. Thank you both so very much. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Thank you. And Katie, you're filling nice to in see you, for honey. me whenever you want, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank Take you. Care. I'm better. going back to bed. Okay. All right, well. Bye. All right, we're going to switch gears. When we come back, we'll talk to UC Hastings law professor Radhika Rao to discuss the SCOTUS leaks on Roe v. Wade. Stay with us. We're at a pivotal moment in American history as the future of a woman's right to choose whether or not she wants to grow and give birth to a baby hangs in the balance. The fallout continues after last week's bombshell Supreme Court leak. 
a draft opinion showing justices could overturn Roe v. Wade this summer. Now some states are lining up to pass restrictive laws of their own in addition to those that have already passed laws like Texas, Mississippi, and Florida. Joining us now to discuss the legal battle is Radhika Rao, a UC Hastings professor and former Supreme Court clerk. Thank you so much for joining us here, Professor Rao. Thank you, Kristen. So you clerked for Justice Harry Blackman, the author of the Roe v. Wade opinion, actually, that established abortion rights for women. Did you ever think the day would come that Roe could be overturned after almost 50 years? No, I didn't. Poor Justice Blackman would be turning in his grave now, uh, not only because Roe looks like it is about to be overturned, but because of the shocking manner in which this draft opinion does so. All right, well, let's talk about that. Uh, there have been leaks. You know, some people criticize the leak more. Other people criticize the contents of the leak. But regardless, it shows that Chief Justice Roberts had actually been working behind the scenes to try to find a way to uphold Mississippi's law without overturning the Roe framework completely. Explain to people how that could be done, what he's trying to do here. So what Chief Justice Roberts is trying to do is really balance on a tightrope. And it's an incredibly difficult task. And I actually don't think it can be done, not in a principled fashion. So what he wants to do is to uphold the Mississippi law, which prohibits abortion completely after 15 weeks of pregnancy. But the reason that that's so difficult to be done under prevailing precedent, under Roe versus Wade, is because Roe draws the line at fetal viability. And what fetal viability means is the point at which the fetus has the capacity to survive outside of the womb, outside of the woman's body. That prior to that time, a woman should have a constitutional right to terminate her pregnancy. But after viability, the state could prohibit abortion. And at the time of Roe, viability was roughly 24 weeks in pregnancy. Now it's more around 20 weeks in pregnancy. But 15 weeks is clearly too early. There's no way, it, there's no place and no medical technology that could preserve a fetus that early in pregnancy. So if you draw the line and say women cannot have an abortion after 15 weeks, that's totally flouting the viability line, which has been the prevailing precedent mm -hmm. up until now. Okay, so there's some other things going on now on the state level. Mississippi's governor is also not ruling out a ban on birth control and the morning after pill uh, if Roe goes. And Louisiana Republicans are working on a bill that would allow prosecutors to charge women um, getting abortions with murder. Can these things actually happen? And would the Constitution allow that? Yes. If this opinion becomes the law of the land, then it would be possible for states to make abortion completely illegal, not even at only at 15 weeks, but even from the moment of conception. And by the way, conception is when we're talking about the joinder of sperm and egg. So there are some methods of contraception which operate after conception, which prevent the early embryo from implanting in a woman's uterus. So what about a state that says, we believe that life begins at conception? So a contraceptive that prevents implantation of the embryo in a woman's uterus, we think that's a method of abortion. So we're going to prohibit it. But what, Under this opinion, that would be constitutional. What about for states like California that really believe in expanding even abortion rights? Um, could that ever be touched in the sense that, like you hear Senate Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell, who could become Majority Leader again after the midterms, you know, who knows what's going to happen, it's possible. Um, he is saying, look, is it possible for lawmakers to codify or make it law, essentially, the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe? He was asked about that, um, and he seemed to suggest it is possible. If that did happen, wouldn't that supersede what California would like to do and provide? Brilliant question. You are so right. If the federal government enacts a law that says that abortion is illegal across the country, that would supersede California's own laws. And that would become the law of the land. Now, the hope is that number one, Congress would not be able to enact such a law. But that depends upon we the people to vote to make sure that there are not the votes in Congress to enact such a law. 
Number two, if such a law is enacted, the question, I guess, is would that be constitutional? Would that go beyond Congress's power? And previously, the Supreme Court has held in cases involving the Violence Against Women's Act that when Congress legislates on matters that do not involve commerce, its commerce power, then it lacks the authority, it lacks the jurisdiction. But I'm not confident that this Supreme Court will rule that this kind of an issue is beyond the jurisdiction of Congress. So if Congress should enact such a law, mm -hmm. this court might very well rule it to be constitutional. All right, Professor Rao, please don't go away. We do have to take a break here on the air, but we'll continue this conversation on Facebook Live, uh, including talking about what other rights might be next. We'll be right back. All right, so Professor Rao, some people say if same-sex marriage goes, I'm sorry, um, if Roe goes, if um, abortion rights go, then same-sex marriage could be next. Um, how so? Are they protected under the same thing that will be struck down? Yes, that's exactly the logic. So basically the logic of Justice Alito's opinion in this case is that the reason that he thinks abortion is not protected is that it's not explicitly mentioned in the text of the Constitution. It's part of this unenumerated right to privacy and to due process, to substantive due process. But if abortion isn't constitutionally protected because it's not explicitly mentioned in the text of the Constitution, then neither is contraception, as I said, explicitly mentioned in the text of the Constitution, nor is the fundamental right to marry. So next on the chopping block could be contraception, the right to marry, the right to choose your sexual partner with whom you're going to have sex with, and a whole slew of intimate relationships that are all protected under the same rubric. So how does it work when you have something written hundreds of years ago that doesn't spell out every thing that's going to be invented or come to be hundreds of years from now, um, isn't it always open to interpretation and evolving? Yes. That's the method of constitutional philosophy that I believe in. And that's the method that has been pre prevalent in the court up until now. But Justice Alito, in this opinion, is sketching out a very different, a much more cramped vision of constitutional interpretation. I think that that actually contradicts the original intent of the people who drafted the Constitution. The framers of our Constitution deliberately used broad and capacious language oh, because they wanted the around. Constitution to evolve. Thank you so very much. On that note, we are out of time. We'll continue this conversation another day as this issue continues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today on this interactive show, Getting Answers. Today, we really appreciate Dr. Bob Walker and his wife, Katie Hafner, um, who has COVID right now for joining us and sharing their experience. We'll be here every weekday at 3 on air and on live stream answering your questions. Bye-bye.